Hey everyone, hope you all are doing well. In this video lecture, we are going to cover lecture 11. Um, the lecture, the PowerPoint slides have already been posted on your um, canvas, uh, so you can access the uh, PowerPoint from there. But basically, this will be a continuation of lecture 10. In lecture 10, we looked into, um, you know, the business cycle and when an economy underperforms, you know, uh, basically the main problem is unemployment during recession. So we looked into and analyzed how uh, an economy went into a recession and uh, how a dynamic free market economy came out of a recession or self-corrected itself over time, right? Um, we also looked into how an economy became overheated and how a dynamic free market economy came out of that overheated uh, uh, overheated point uh, to br bring it back to full, full employment. And during overheated economy, the main problem was inflation. Um, we also saw that the self-correction process takes a very long time. So we need the government to come in and act uh, and implement different types of policies to expedite the recovery process or um, to lower down the inflation. So we are just going to continue that to understand the different types of, um, you know, understanding. Last class, we talked about institutional production possibility curve. Today, we're going to talk our, and focus more on Phillips curve and macro model. And these are, again, macro topics, uh, which helps us to understand the different topics in macroeconomics. So uh, as discussed, as an overview from last class, when the economy is underperforming and when there is recession, the main problem is unemployment. On the other hand, when the economy is overheated and it is beyond the full employment uh, point where demand is greater than supply and there is shortage in the market, we have inflation, which is the major problem. So in short run situations, when in the short term, there is a trade off between inflation rate and unemployment rate, which means if infl inflation rate increase, unemployment will decrease. On the other hand, if inflation decreases, unemployment will increase. But in the long run situations where significant changes are occurring in the economy and capacity um, of the factors of production can be changed and technological improvements can change. So or can happen, both unemployment and inflation can decrease at the same time. Or we can have a situation where both inflation and unemployment increases at the same time, which is really bad. And we learned that it's, that situation is called stagflation. So in the short run, usually unemployment and inflation will have a negative relationship and they will move in opposite directions. But in the long run, this relationship no longer holds true. They can be opposite. They can move together um, in, in the uh, positive direction or they can decrease at, um, or they can increase at the same time. So in the short run, any changes affect the economy quickly. So when you are, if anything happens in the short run, the impact on the economy will be greater. On the other hand, in the long run, if there are any changes, it will take a significant amount of time to begin to impact the economy, okay? And a large amount of time to complete its effects. So it will take a long time to show the impact of the change on the economy. If there are no significant long-run changes, the economy's capacity and incentive to produce will remain the same. Okay, so capacity means the amount of factors of production and incentive to produce means um, the urge and the interest of the producers to produce more in the economy. So if there are no significant changes in the long run, these will remain fixed and not change. Okay, so when there is economic stability, there is a trade-off or inverse relationship between unemployment rate and inflation, as, as I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture. So this trade-off or this inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment rate can be expressed through a graph, and that graph is known as the Phillips curve. So Phillips curves basically represents the short term. Remember, this relationship only holds true in the short run, not in the long run. So the Phillips curve basically is a graphical representation of the short run trade off between inflation rate and unemployment rate. So basically the curve will show when inflation rate goes up, unemployment will decrease. When inflation rate goes down, unemployment will increase. Okay. And the trade off usually occurs when the total spending changes. 
So based on the relationship, the Phillips curve is a downward sloping curve to reflect the inverse relationship. And again, this holds true only in the short run. So let's look how a Phillips curve will look like. So we have a curve where the y-axis is your inflation and the x-axis is the unemployment rate, okay? So basically, this is a graph that shows the relationship between inflation and unemployment rate, right? And we know that in the short run, this is the short run. So basically in the short run, unemployment and inflation have an inverse relationship. So we have a downward sloping Phillips curve. And this curve is known as Phillips curve, okay? So getting deeper into the Phillips curve, the position of the Phillips curve at any one point in time is determined by the capacity and incentive of the economy to produce. These do not change in the short run. So in the short run, we are not going to see any changes in the capacity of the factors of production. Just think, the amount, the factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurs, they are fixed in the short run. In the long run, they can vary. But in the short run, the quantity is fixed. And also the incentive the, to produce is fixed in the short run. So these changes don't happen. But in the long run, a nation can increase or decrease its capability to produce, or it can increase or decrease its incentive to produce. So that's why we're going to see a different relationship between inflation and unemployment in the long run. But in the short run, because these two things cannot change, that's why we are going to have an inverse relationship between unemployment and in, um, uh, inflation. So to understand more, the graph shows the short run movement along the Phillips curve as total spending increases. So going back to the curve here, if you are at point A, if total spending increases in the economy, so if people, if consumers are spending more in the economy, we know the capacity to produce as well as the incentive produce remains fixed in the short run. So suppliers cannot increase their output in the short run, but if demand goes up, uh, by the consumers, then what's going to happen is there's going to be a movement along the curve and it's going to go up. So basically inflation will go up, but then unemployment will fall in the short run. Okay, so that's what point A is talking about. Movement along the Phillips curve as total spending increases. So when there are is total spending increases, there will be a movement above the curve or along the curve. And if the total spending decreases, then it will move downwards, then inflation will go down and unemployment will go up. The vice versa is also going to happen. So it's depicting the inverse relationship between um, in inflation and unemployment. So it also shows the short run movement along the new Phillips curve as the cap capability or incentive to produce increase, both inflation and un unemployment falls. So in the case, which is point B, which we are going to look, and I'm going to change the color so it's easy for you guys to understand. So let's say in the long run, now the capacity uh, to produce or the incentive to produce increase. So what's going to happen is the Phillips curve is going to shift to the left. And we, this is depicted by point B. So both in this case, both inflation falls and both unemployment falls compared to point A, right? So point B basically shows movement to a new Phillips curve. So we are moving from a new from a, the old Phillips curve to the new Phillips curve as the capability to produce or the incentive to produce of the economy has increased. Now, if it has decreased, if it would have decreased, then what would happen? This curve would shift to the left and inflation and un unemployment would go up. So that is basically in the long run. These things are happening in the long run and the black curve is in the short run. The movement in the short run, we will see movement along the curve. In the long run, when capacity of to produce as well as the incentive to produce can be changed or increase or decrease, then the Phillips curve will move to the left or to the right, depending on whether they're increasing or decreasing.
So from the Phillips curve, we are going to derive another model or build a model of the economy, and that model is known as the macro model. So to build this model, we will focus on the employment rate, not the unemployment rate. In the Phillips curve, we were focusing on the unemployment rate, but on the new macro model that we're going to look into, we're going to focus on employment rate. So employment rate is basically 100 percent minus your unemployment rate that is that will give your em employment rate okay so once we do that the resulting Phillips curve would appear as a mirror image to the previous one so basically in the macro model we're just gonna mimic or we're just gonna we're just gonna have the Phillips curve reflect on the opposite direction so because we're looking at the employment rate, right? So going back again, we have unemployment rate here, inflation here. Now let's say we look into macro model. Okay, and in the macro model, we have the curve here. Let's say we still have inflation on the y-axis, the inflation rate. But now on the x-axis, we have employment rate instead of unemployment rate. Okay, because we are changing from unemployment rate to employment rate, we are going to flip this curve and it will be a reflection of this Phillips curve. So basically, it's going to look like this. And this is basically your aggregate supply curve of the economy. That's the total supply curve of the entire economy. Okay, so the assumption of the curve still holds true that at any one point, the location of the Phillips curve is fixed by the capability and incentive of the economy to produce. Now, changes in the total spending causes movement along the Phillips curve. And, and basically, the location of the Phillips curve traces out the nation's supply side. And this is the aggregate supply curve. So the mirror image of the Phillips curve, when we flip the Phillips curve and we do a mirror image of it, it, is the, it gives us the aggregate supply curve. Because again, remember, we are not looking with the reason we are flipping it is because we are considering employment rate under the macro model and not unemployment rate. So we are flipping it. And when we flip it, we get the aggregate supply or in other words, the total supply of the economy at a particular point of time. Now, the nation's desire to spend is depicting by a downward sloping line that intersects the aggregate supply curve at, at the point indicated by the current employment and inflation rate. So basically, the country's total demand is going to be a downward sloping curve. Again, because if price goes up, demand will fall. And if price goes down, demand will go up. Based on the law of demand, we know we have a negative relationship between price and demand. So that uh, the so the country's demand curve or the desire to spend is basically going to be depicted in the same macro model, and it's going to be a downward sloping curve like this, and that is your aggregate demand curve. Okay, so we get the total spending of the economy, and we get the total supply of the economy. The point where they intersect. That is the stable point. This is the employment rate of the economy and this is the inflation rate of the economy. Again, we know this slopes downwards and to the right because the nation can and will want to buy larger quantity of goods and services at a lower inflation rate and lower quantities at higher prices or higher inflation rates. This macro model describes the current conditions and trends in the economy in the most timely manner. Um, okay, so this macro model, we use this macro model. If you look at this macro model, we use it to describe um, the current situation in the economy. Like if they are operating above, we're going to understand that there is a surplus in the market. If they are operating below, we're going to say there is a shortage in the market. If they are at the intersecting point, we're going to say they are at equilibrium. So, there are three interrelated variables to macroeconomics, inflation rate, unemployment rate, and real GDP. We saw inflation and unemployment rates are reported on a monthly basis, and GDP is reported on a quarterly basis. This is just, again, we are trying to explain the macro model, y-axis has the inflation rate, x-axis has the employment rate. And employment rate, the reason we choose employment rate versus unemployment rate is to so that improvements in the employment are shown as movement to the right. Because when there are improvements in the employment, 
there, the curves will shift to the right, which means there will be improvements in the GDP or the total output in the economy. So in this type of macro model, there can be four types of model, mo movements, okay, in the macro model. So we understand the mac in the macro model depicts the aggregate demand or the total desire of the nations, the, the total um, uh, desire of the nation to spend as well as the total supply of the country or the nation, which is reflected by the aggregate demand and aggregate supply. But then two things, four things of can happen in this macro, macro model, okay? They are as follows. So let's first look into the first one. Employment rate rises and inflation rate also rises, okay? So this will happen when total spending increases in the short run. Um, so remember in the short run, the capacity to produce as well as the incentive to produce are fixed and stable and cannot be changed. So that means the aggregate supply curve cannot move to the left or the right. It remains fixed in the short run. But the aggregate demand curve can shift to the left or the right. In the case when total spending increases, then what happens is the aggregate demand curve will shift to the right and that will cause an increase in employment rate and inflation rate. So let's look at look look at this scenario in terms of the graph okay so let's say again we are starting with the aggregate demand curve and then we have the aggregate supply curve yeah and then remember this is inflation like always the y-axis for the macro model is inflation and x-axis is the employment rate and we look into the employment rate because improvements in employment would mean improvements in gdp so here we are saying in the short run so I'm going to make it shorter so you can see in the short run the aggregate supply will not change because the capacity to produce or the incentive to produce remains fixed and it cannot change but total spending can increase so if total spending increases the aggregate demand curve will shift to the right so if that happens look at the new equilibrium point which is why? Why is the new equilibrium point? So if this was your inflation, this was your new inflation, inflation has gone up E and employment is also going up from E to E1. So then there is an increase in total spending. So you need to look into the short run for coming up, increase in total spending, and there is an increase in total spending that will mean the demand curve or the aggregate demand curve. To go up as well as the to go up. Okay, so that's the first case scenario. Remember, we have four types of movement. That's the first movement where the aggregate demand curve shifts to the right. Now we can have the second type scenario, which is also in the short run. This is when there is a decrease in total spending in the short run. What, what do you think is going to happen in this case? Right, so in the short run, again, we do not see any changes in the aggregate supply curve. So aggregate supply curve stays the same, but now we see the aggregate demand curve will shift to the left. I'm sorry, let me draw it properly. This is like really... Okay, so that's aggregate supply, that's aggregate demand. It's going to shift to the left because short run, in the short run, there is a decrease in total spending. So consumers are now spending less on output, but we can, but the producers cannot reduce output because capacity to produce or the incentive to produce is fixed. So aggregate supply curve stays the same. But when this happens, look at the new equilibrium. Employment and inflation also falls right so employment rate falls and inflation rate falls this happens when total spending decreases in the short run as the total spending decreases the aggregate demand curve shifts to the left aggregate cup supply curve stays the same so inflation rate and employment rate decreases so these are the two short run scenarios first two curves 
are short run scenarios. Now we're going to look into long run scenarios. And again, uh, this is the macro model, right? So we're going to have inflation on the y axis and employment on the x axis. Okay, so we have aggregate supply, we have aggregate demand, again, we have aggregate supply, we have aggregate demand. Okay, so first, now we're going to see in the long run scenario. So this is long run. Now, capacity or incentive to produce, capacity or incentive to produce increases. When capacity or incentive to produce increases, the aggregate supply curve will shift to the right in the long run. And when we see a shift in the aggregate supply curve to the right, the inflation rate falls, but employment goes up, right? So that's the next case. Employment rate rise, which is a good thing, and inflation falls. That's also a good thing. So it's a double winner. So this happens when the capacity or the incentive to produce increases in the long run. So aggregate supply curve will shift to the right, but aggregate demand curve stays, um, you know, fixed. The last case scenario is also a long run case. In this case, we are going to see the capacity to produce or the incentive to produce decreases. It can happen for many reasons. Maybe there is a war going on. Maybe there was a natural disaster. So the capacity to produce or incentive to produce decreases. Again, these are written in the slide too. So if you don't understand my handwriting, you can go back to the slide and see. When that happens, the aggregate supply curve will shift to the left. And as a result, your inflation will go up and your employment will fall, which is a bad thing, right? So in this case, the employment rate will fall and infl inflation will rise. This happens when capacity or the incentive to produce decreases, supply curve shifts to the left, and therefore, you know, we see this phenomenon. So these are the two thing, four things that can happen. Two of them are in the short run, which basically relates to total spending. And when there's changes in the total spending, we're going to see shifts in the aggregate demand curve. And the two other movements are in the long run. Those are changes in the capacity or incentive to produce. And when there are changes in the capacity or incentive to produce, the aggregate supply curve will shift left or right. So what causes movement in the macro model? The short run movement occurs when there is no change in the capability or incentive to produce, but there is a change in total spending. An increase in total spending will cause the aggregate demand curve to shift to the right, and a decrease in total spending will cause the aggregate demand curve to shift to the left. We have seen the graphs, and we have also seen this. Like in the long run, if there is an increase in the capacity or incentive to produce, aggregate supply curve will shift to the left. If there's a decrease in, in the incentive or capacity produced, the aggregate supply curve will shift to the left. We have looked at the graphs. Now, what are some factors that affect production cost and productivity? So factors that affect production cost of businesses are listed below. So the cost of production of a business, when they are producing a final good or services, what are the costs or what are the factors that affect this factor of this cost of production? And what and basically, when these factors of production, when, when, when these factors change, their cost of production will go up. And that's going to cause a shift in the aggregate supply curve to the left or the right, depending on what's happening. So those factors are business tax. So if business taxes go up, cost of production will go up and aggregate supply curve will shift to the left. Supply will go down. On the other hand, if business taxes go down, cost of production will go down and aggregate supply curve will shift to the right. Supply will go up. Then the second factor is cost of complying with government regulations. If there are more regulations, then that means there's more cost. So that means the cost of production will go up and supply will fall. Vice versa is also true. Finally, the cost of the resource or input. If the cost of the labor or the workers, if say, if let's say their wage rates go up, or if the cost of the machines go up, then cost of production will go up. And as a result, supply will decrease and aggregate supply curve will shift to the left. The opposite is also true. Now, the factors that affect the productivity are listed below. And when these change, we will also see 
um, a shift in the aggregates of light curve. So when there are changes in the productivity of the factors of production, we're going to see changes in the aggregates of light curve as well. First of all, the quality of human capital. If the quality of the workers get improve and they become more skilled and talented and knowledgeable, that means they can produce more output in a smaller amount of time, which means the supply will go up and the aggregate supply curve will shift to the right. On the other hand, if their quality decrease, they become unskilled, aggregate supply curve is going to shift to the left because supply is going to go down because they don't have the skills to produce the output. Second is innovations, right? If there are new, new innovations, new methods coming in that are more efficient to produce output, it's going to cause shifts in the aggregate supply curve to the right. Supply will go up. If there are improvements in new technology, of course, if technology becomes more efficient and they can produce more output in a smaller number of hours, aggregate supply curve will increase and the curve will shift to the right. Another factor is incentive given for working more or harder. If you give more incentives to the workers to work more hours or to work harder, they will become more productive. And as a result, aggregate supply curve will increase and it will shift to the right. Finally, personal taxes on work. If personal taxes go down on work, then you are going to work more and aggregate supply curve will shift to the right. If personal taxes go up, which means you have to pay more taxes from your income, so you are going to work less, you, are, you won't have the incentive to work more, and as a result, aggregate supply curve will shift to the left. So these shifts, like the shift in aggregate demand curve to the right, left, or shift of the aggregate supply curve to the right or left, these happen in the real world situations over the last 30, 40 years. And basically, the next few slides are going to give us some examples of these movements. I'm not going to spend too much time on these. These are certain examples. They are there for you to understand how these macro models really applied in the real world situations. Okay. So for instance, during the mid 1960s, when the 1960s, the government spending increased rapidly in response to the Vietnam War and the war on poverty and great society, right? So uh, because there was a war and they, uh, the government was trying to eradicate poverty, so the government increased the total spending. They were spending more in the economy, and as a result, total spending increased. When this happened, what did you think happened to the aggregate demand? When government increased spending, the aggregate demand also increased, and the aggregate demand curve shifted to the right. Okay? The opposite happened. The aggregate demand curve shifted to the left when total spending in the economy decreased during the Great Depression. So between 1929 and 1932, we had the Great Depression, uh, exports decreased, there was a tight monetary policy, there were some bank failures, uh, inventories of goods were building up in the market, um, you know, businesses were not, not making investments, consumers were spending less. So this ultimately caused the aggregate demand curve to shift to the left. You know, so that's another example of um, the macro model. Here you will see some other examples of, um, you know, what we discussed about the macro model. I think you can read and understand. I really don't have to explain these. These are self-explanatory. So the in slide 15, it basically talks about we had a supply shock situation in 1973 and 74 and also in 1979 and 1980 period. Basically, when the price of crude oil in the world market went up, the U.S. economy experienced a supply shock. So what happened is the cost of production for most of the uh, companies went up. And as a result, the aggregate supply curve shifted to the left, causing a stagflation issue because unemployment rate rose. And at the same time, inflation went up. So that was a very uh, bad situation we had in those during those time periods between 1973, 1974 and 1979-1980. Finally, in uh, you know, 80 between 1982 to 1983, again 84 to 86, 92 to 94, and 96 to 97, we saw enormous gains in the productivity of the labor as well as the technology and capital. And there were new machines, new internet, new technology coming up uh, every other now and then. There was deregulation of business, less compliance, and taxes were lowered. And all of these caused the aggregate supply curve to shift to the right. So this caused the inflation rate to go down and unemployment to fall as well as employment went up and GDP went up. So these are some real world examples. You can read through it and try to understand 
um, how you you how the macro model can be used in the real world examples. So we are the last topic we're going to talk about is the macroeconomy goal. Um, the goal of the macroeconomic policies that the government implement is basically to achieve full employment, right? And that when we achieve full employment, we are assuming that all the resources are technically employed, uh, given the institutional laws we have, right? So at full employment, the economy is basically operating at the institutional PPC and we are fully productively efficient. It, at that point, the, when, we, when, when the economy is operating at full employment, the unemployment rate that exists at that time is known as the natural rate of unemployment. Okay, so economy will ultimately adjust to reach this natural rate of unemployment in the long run. Um, this rate is also known as a non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. This mean what this means is if unemployment rate declines below the full employment rate, inflation will accelerate upwards. Remember that is what causes the overheated situation in the economy, right? When we are at full employment level, we are basically at the at the natural rate of unemployment. This is normal and this is probably the best case scenario and the lowest unemployment rate. But if we have a situation which is known as the non accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, what happens is the unemployment rate falls below the natural rate of unemployment. Remember in the last lecture we talked that you know the point beyond the institutional PPC but below the physical PPC. If we are at that point, at that case, when the unemployment rate decreases, the inflation will accelerate or increase upwards. And that's going to cause an overheated situation in the economy. At this point, the aggregate supply curve suddenly climbs upward faster than before. Okay, so underperforming region when unemployment is high and inflation is rising at a slower rate. An overheated region is when unemployment is too low and inflation rate rises rapidly at an accelerating rate. Full employment is reflected by the vertical dash lines in the macro model. So basically now we are going to look at the macro model where we are going to see how we can use this macro model to understand which is the underperforming, which is the underperforming economy and what is the over, overheated economy. So we're going to have two graphs. Okay, so the macro model basically says we have aggregate supply and aggregate demand in aggregate supply, aggregate demand, this is inflation, this is employment, this is inflation, this is employment. So the vertical line, the point where they intersect, that's basically your full employment. Okay, now if a recession happens, the aggregate demand curve will shift to the left and basically this is the underperforming region. When we are operating on the left side of this vertical line, this is underperforming region. And that's what's being said in the slide. The other one basically says again, this is the vertical line where they are mean and this is the full employment. This is the full employment. But when there is an increase in inflation, we're going to see the aggregate demand curve shifts to the right, and this is basically overheated. This is an overheated economy, and that is your new AD. Okay, so that is what is said in this um, uh, slide. So usually, full employment rate varies between 3% to 6%. It can change from time to time based on wh where we are at the economy and how, what type of resources are available and all that. Uh, the location of the full employment rate can change as institutional imp impediments to hiring and production change. It can be, if institutional impediments go down, uh, na natural rate of unemployment will go down. If it goes up, it's going to go up. It can also change as frictional and structural unemployment changes. So if there are more impediments or frictional or um, structural unemployment increase, then full employment rate will occur at a higher unemployment rate. The opposite is also true. So basically the goal of macroeconomics is to have the economy performing exactly at the institutional PPC, which means they are at full employment level. Okay, Neither inflation nor unemployment is a problem and when we are at full employment level and that is the ILO case scenario. So that is the end of this lecture.
Um, we are going to finish here. Next class, we are going to cover lecture 12. Thank you very much. You guys have a good day.